Back in 2013, when I worked on overnights, I would get off of work in the bright early morning hours, and I'd go and have a cup of coffee or maybe a cheap breakfast, and I would sit down with a laptop. And Just one day, I decided to come up with some short story scenarios. Well, it doesn't matter if short story scenarios, just story scenarios, just whatever popped into my mind at the time. And over the course of three weeks, I roughly hammered out about 40, 50, 60 scenarios. Some of the craziest ideas I could come up with. It was something of a throwback from uh, from uh, reading one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Alfred Bester, where he would take the craziest ideas and make them as convincing as possible. And that's kind of like the spirit of science fiction you know, you would you would have the hard science fiction written by technicians who love to get into the details of the science, and then there are the fantasists who they would just pull whatever stuff out of a hat and make it work in a storyline. And then there's that kind of weird Brad Ray Bradbury, Alfred Bester, you know, kind of between hard science and fantasy, where they 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 uh, wrote based on the story and there were some stupid ideas some were science fiction ideas some were dramatic fiction ideas some were just dumb ideas in 2013 well that's in this day and age that could be as far back as the invention of the wheel or the discovery of fire but 2013 has come and gone and I still have that stack of short story ideas. And a few years ago, I think it was 2018, 2019, I decided to take and figure out, just pick one of the uh, story ideas and run with it. So, as I'm looking up on, I looked up on the laptop to see if I could find the original file. So, yeah, it's uh, quite a few of them. Anyway, this story started as a uh, the idea. Sometimes I would come up with a title. And this one was The Infinite Parts of Pain. And the synopsis is, A man loses an arm in an accident. The arm was never recovered. Six months later, someone exactly like him was spotted. His arm grew into another person who had no idea who he was. The man was found to be a boon to living forever as a man copy. Once he was found, captured, and had his arm chopped off, would grow into another self out of that arm without generation of the original, or without gen degeneration of the original. And that was... That was among a strings of story ideas it's actually kind of depressing all the things all the things that one wants to do and so little time between the hour and a half round trip commute to the daily job and a plethora of other objectives that i am not doing because i'm too busy trying to get this stuff going anyway the part I'm getting at here is that this story has evolved over the last few years and some there was a port there was a uh, point in time I wanted to try to be pragmatic with the writing um there was another story it was about 40 43 pages and with the second reading of the short story it was done the short story was done it was it was like hallelujah like chimes and angels falling down from the sky one of those rare occasions where i actually finished a short story the trick was obviously played on me because the end of the story was as i was rewriting the end of the story there were three characters in this ending i'm not going to get into the details that has nothing to do with this specifically it does have something to do with it but it doesn't anyway so the 43-page short story 
over the course of a year and a half became 580 pages of a first draft. And it's, again, so little time and so much to do. It's on a back burner. It's on a the back burner of a stove that's behind 10 other stoves that have 10 other things on 10 other back burners. Anyway. So that was the intention behind this, was to try to not fall into that. Have a short story, keep it a short story, that's that. And it's, you just find that a story has a life of its own. And it's going to be a long story, it's going to be a short story. And some writers, they are good with being really sparse with the language. Um, I'm not particularly. Uh, I I write a lot better than I talk. I'm not that. I'm not a talker, to say the least. So when I'm recording, when I'm reading off the stories, there's I will I will have a half hour file that's pared down to maybe nine minutes, and that's how many times I cut and cut and cut because either the brain is trying to edit as I'm reading it out loud, or the fact that. Uh, I just, I'm not a natural talker, prevents me from, uh, well, just not practiced at it. So practice makes perfect. We'll get on to that later on. So anyway, back to this story. So this story with the guy with his missing arm, <clears throat> uh, I ran with it. And it it grew and shrank and grew and shrank and grew and shrank and And uh, again, a story has a life of its own, and one can dictate, you know, some there are people who are m malignant with their outlining down to the last word. I can't do that. If I figured out what the story is all about, I get bored really easily, and it's really, 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 really tough to get that spark, that launching spark, bang, bang, to get inspired in a story if I already know what's going on. And so that requires some kind of discipline, which I'm short on. The uh, story grew into the title Gore Chain. And the the premise so i so when i when i eventually finish reading off the story and again this is why i'm reading them recording them and then playing them back and then going through this process of reading them out loud is because it's part of the editing process you know it's like wow that sentence is really fucked up but that doesn't make any sense why did you write it like that and it works in line with the writing process. You know, a sentence sounds natural, though it might not be grammatically correct, and I'm not too terribly worried about grammatically correct. Um, if people understand what the hell's going on, then I'd grammar be damned. Obviously not to have the grammar of a three-year-old, though I obviously have the reading skills of a three-year-old. Sometimes I begin to wonder. Anyway, so Gord Chain developed itself into kind of a halfway zone between the story it could be and the story that it is, trying to pare it down into bare essentials. And I'm not, a piece of fiction is not a technical manual. So to write a piece of fiction with the same technical care of a technical manual it seems kind of contradictory some people make it work and that's the other so that's the other thing too is the the that's not a direct quote i don't remember the direct quote and i'm not going to dick around here trying to search online for it but bill watterson made some comment in the introduction to one of his calvin and hobbes collections and i'm paraphrasing because he was getting on to with, with Calvin's father bicycling and that Bill Watterson was an avid cyclist. I'm basing this on memory from what I've read. 
and he was critical of writers who took their own personal interests and infused them into their whether it's drawing painting whatnot and you see that with with uh, authors and artists that they put their own hobbies and their own passions and their own specific little things and these things are a part of one's personality but they're distinctive from the personality and my my point and i agree with bill watterson on this is that you know it's like politics regardless and i have very clear politics but regardless of one's politics if you're involved in creating a short story politics be damned the story you have to write the story with the voice of that story you can't get if you're writing propaganda great do it it's wonderful great whatever but one's hobbies and one's politics should have something to do with some specific choices that you make in the again whether it's painting writing script writing whatnot but it shouldn't dictate the life of the story the story is its story and that's the honesty the integrity and the honesty of a writer that they write for the story if the story's path takes a different route than their own personal politics they have to be honest with the story and there's a level of integrity in the narrative there's it's just again a story has its own voice it's like it's a living thing and one shouldn't stunt that life of a story through one's own personal fixations. So, having wasted enough time there, this is only a test reading. I'm in the process of a, another edit because this has sat for a while. And uh, I usually find an issue with a story if I continually try to rewrite the first chapter. Somewhere along the line, there's something that's not being dealt with, with me rewriting and rewriting and rewriting a chapter. So there's some characters that appear in the first one or two chapters, and they don't appear throughout the rest of the story. So we're going to work on these characters. Anyway as a test reading gourd chain chapter one what you have here is a gold mine edward gale wasn't impressed with the humor what you have here is a gold mine was the first thing frosty said to edward the day they met eddie was working on a skull on a trucker's bicep when frosty walked through the front door edward was struck by the size of the man less than an inch between the top of frost's head and the top of the door frame Frost made the whole room shrink in scale. The trucker, a regular under Eddie's tattoo gun, was impressed by Frosty's presence. Looks like you're in trouble, Ed. What the hell did you do now? The trucker was always flush with dangerous and lurid stories of his travels, from stunts he pulled when he was a young man out of the service to incidents and accidents and crimes he witnessed during his long hauls across the country. It didn't seem as if the trucker was surprised by anything anymore, not jaded or cynical, but simply lost for his capacity to be surprised. The trucker wasn't a small man either, retaining much of the muscle he had when he was in the service, just with the added girth of age. The trucker glanced up at Eddie. Not anyone you know? Wow, what you've got here is a gold mine. Look at all the cool pictures, wizards and skulls and dragons. The awe in Frosty's voice was genuine, the unsullied joy of a child. Since then, Frosty made comments about what a life Edward lived. Here Eddie Gale was, on a plot of asphalt all his own, at the edge of a dangerous and exciting city in the desert. Geez, Eddie, what a place. It's like living in one of them black-and-white flicks from my dad's day, with the gangsters and crooks and the dames and the gunfights. That's silly, Frosty. This is just a boring corner of a boring city and a boring desert. Eddie thought for a moment. Think of this building as a shipwreck, and we're stranded in an... Think of this building as a shipwreck, and we're stranded on an island in the middle of a big ocean. 
Frosty's simplistic amusement sparked in his eyes. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Frosty's simplistic amusement sparked something in his eyes. So, the tough guys in the long black cars and that weird dude in the old pickup truck must be sharks? When Eddie had enough of Frosty's childlike wonder, he ducked out the back door for a cigarette and a long walk. Frost was good enough to hold down the shipwreck for a while. There weren't any appointments, and less likely any walk-ins. Frost would be glad to tell any stranger where to go. Get lost, pal! Don't you know this area is gangster country? So, that's just kind of a test reading. And it's... Well, it's part of the process. Not that uh, this is anything significant to the world. But. Gorchain is in the uh, final processes. Uh, there is a 400 plus page novel that's finished. The final process of editing that one. And then there's Bullet Out of Night. And the one I'm currently reading, I'm halfway through that one, uh, Blood and Briar. And uh, yeah, there's quite a few projects in the works, apart from doing the, the comic book work. And that's the other thing, too, is that when I was in art school, I was obsessed with surrealistic artwork. And so I got into this idea that I'm just going to do that, just draw weird surrealistic stuff and after a while you just kind of get well why am i doing this and i still draw that stuff it's just it's more for my own amusement but to uh some stories are better off visually told and some are are not quite so Anyway, that's that. Thank you for uh, watching and listening to The Ramble. See ya.